This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. This week we are into our fourth week of the Magician's Relief Project, and if you are interested in learning how that you can either receive some relief or to give some relief, if you want to receive it, then you just need to go to this week's episode at themagicwordpodcast.com, and there is a form to complete down there. And if you have the financial means to assist, then please contact me by email at scott at themagicwordpodcast.com, and I will send you some information how you can assist magic dealers and magicians who could use some relief right now. Well, this week we're going to revisit with an old friend that we haven't talked with on the podcast here in a long number of years. Mr. Chris Randall was our guest back in January of 2012, and at that time he expressed uh, some plans for the next five years. I asked what he was going to do and where he saw himself at that time, and I thought it was kind of interesting perhaps to compare that point in time with where he is then now. So first of all, I want you just to uh, get a snippet of what that conversation was like, what he'd said there. It takes just a little bit less than a minute, and then we will soon go into this week's broadcast in which he talks a lot about the long road that he's had pretty much since then and leading up to his competition act in Busan, South Korea at FISM. So let's jump in the old TARDIS and go back to January 24th, 2012 to hear what Chris Randall had to say back then. So five years from now, where do you see your, you know, Chris Randall? Where will you be? Where Probably you not on the street anymore. Uh... <laughs> You got all the experience you need. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I, this is my last year, but I think my brain can't take it anymore. Uh, just corporate You're only events. 26 or something. What are you? 30. 30. Yeah, I'm getting old. Uh, I think just private parties, just continuing to do this, magic conventions. Just as long as I can pay the bills doing magic, that's all that matters. As long as I don't have to go back to waiting tables or any regular job, um, I'm happy. Not a regular job. Not a regular right. job. It's fun being a magician. Yeah, I like making my own hours. And Follow your passion. Yeah, do what you love. That's the secret to life. That's right. Well, that says a lot right there. So now at age 38, let's rejoin Chris with where he is now at this point in life and hear a few comments from our friend Chris Randall here on The Magic Word. Well, today I've got with me a guest who is a multi-award winning magician and someone who has uh, had his ups and downs uh, as far as uh, being um, working on the streets in Las Vegas and working in showrooms and casinos and around the world in different places as a lecturer and having some wonderful ideas out there on his DVDs and his lectures that he has uh, presented. And uh, also, as I said, has uh, won several awards in the IBM and is uh, maybe soon to be heading to FISM. So please welcome my friend, Mr. Chris Randall. Hi there, Chris. Thanks, buddy. Uh, <laughs> and also a um, a Scott Wells uh, two-time lecturer. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you've been my boss. You've been my boss twice. And uh, the last time I did one of these was at uh, Torchy's Tacos, I believe. That's right. That's right. That's a very good memory. And every time that I take another magician over there to Torchy's Tacos, I always say, you know, when we post this picture, I know that Chris Randall is going to be one of the first people to, to say something because he said, hey, that's, I thought that was our place, buddy. I know. It was the best taco I've had in a long time. I had Roberto's today. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, it was one of my favorite experiences. It's always uh, seeing you at IBM's and uh, we Midwest Jubilees and just we constantly run e into each other all over the world. We so do well. You know, it's always I, good to talk to you. Thank you, and I enjoy going to conventions. And uh, likewise, it's my pleasure always getting a chance to uh, chat with you. And uh, always been quite cordial and and uh, very professional in uh, what you have been working on. And during the course of this, I also then want to talk about uh, what your act was like and about Joni Spina, you know, and years ago and how that she had changed your act and everything. But really, kind of one of the things that uh, I want to talk about, you know, is Las Vegas. And I know that you were working on the street there in Fremont uh, Street, uh, in the Fremont Experience. I'd mentioned that before uh, when I was introducing you here. And I just wondered if you're still doing much of that anymore. 
Um, so around January 25th, I made a, a very conscious decision to stop doing street performing for a little bit. Um, I had done Fremont Street Experience for over 10 years. Wow. Uh, February 14th would have been my 10th year. And uh, I turned uh, 39 here in about like a week. So I had two rules. I didn't want to do 10 years or turn 40 on Fremont Street Experience. <laughs> uh, not only that, we had gotten word that uh, Derek Stevens, he's the owner of the D Hotel, which I had my show back in 2014, and he's also the owner of uh, the Golden Gate, and he's the builder of uh, Circa, the newest hotel on Fremont. We got word that when Circa opens, uh, he will have enough um, – property on Fremont Street Experience to make it a private street. Wow. So at the end of this year, this is the final year of people performing on the Fremont Street Experience and lecturing around the world. And uh, I did, you know, 36 countries uh, right before I kind of semi retired from magic. I counted 500 flights to so my left leg. It had a pretty hard uh, <laughs> run around the world a few times. Um, I looked around Fremont Street Experience, and because I taught my act so much, uh -huh. I was looking at ten versions of me. Uh, oh, that's so interesting. It was like, people who had watched your lecture or had taken your notes, and then when you see them doing a Bill and Lemon with a Crown Royal bag, it's like, I taught you that, but that's a different variation. But you're seeing you in that. Well, no, they weren't doing different variations. Like I met a lot of people on Fremont who weren't very good at street performing okay uh some who were fantastic magicians and the person i can mention uh who will totally admit to this scott sean scott mm -hmm. who's one of the most brilliant inventors of all time he wasn't really good at street performing so i said float a card at the beginning do bill and lemon at the end like i say to all all my students so like the old standard was you got a table and you did kind of a gaza -y version of a yeah. street act with a melon under the hat and that became the uh world standard then it became floating a card at the beginning, card to mouth in the middle, and Bill and Lemon or Inception at the end. And it became so the common thing that it started getting away from me. And I, I had heard speeches like this from guys like Kevin James where they had sold off their act because it was going to get ripped off anyway, or they could sell it and get the credit and the money, but then it got away from them so much so where – Kevin James went into a gig and he went to do his act one time and they were like, oh, everybody does this. He goes, it's my act. <laughs> and <I'm> like, <laughs> so, um, it happens all the time. You know, like I know Michael Lamar has talked to me about this. A lot of my buddies who well, sold what? their material. You in know? fact, that's a very good point as well. I remember talking with Banachek about that several years ago when he was still on the college circuit and back when we were start, first starting to sell the uh, psychokinetic pins, you know, the the uh, big pin that would the tip over kind of a thing, uh, and plus other things that he did. But anyhow, that uh, that was one of the things that we were commercially selling and have sold tens of thousands of those things over the years. The point is that when he would get these reports back from the colleges about what they liked and didn't like, it said, well, we've already seen the, you know much of your act already, you know, this uh, psychokinetic touches and some other things. It's like, yeah, but I was the originator of that. Well, you know, bad on you for having taught those to other people who are now kind of ripping you off. So I, I know exactly what you're saying. You're just a lot of clones. And I am a clone of Scott Alexander and of Steve Spill. And uh, and I would say Doc Easton, but Doc Easton does the Steve Spill. Well, that's, that's a good uh, point. You know, the, but are we clones or are we... Um, Quentin Tarantino said he kind of remixes everything. Okay. And I kind of feel that the same way. Like, I... There's yeah, there's a, probably a Matt King line in my act and a David Copperfield line in my act and this and a Lance moment. You've seen my act a million times. Sure. You know, there's Jonathan Neal Brown moments, McBride moments, Lance moments. Um, I think as long as you're not openly stealing from these people, but it, I, I see it as like mini shout outs. Mm -hmm. um, there, you're going to be influenced. When I first had my first DVD reviewed by Mike Close, and by the way, I've been watching Mike Close on uh, his Facebook, Facebook? recently. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's the Ambitious Card uh, video uh, was amazing. The opening palm he teaches just floored me. But anyway, uh, Mike Close reviewed me, and it was one of the longest bad reviews in Magic Magazine history. Wow. And me and Mike became friends over it because I called him instead of like, 
bitching to him like, oh, you know what you're talking about. Blah, 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 blah. I walked across the street from Caesar's Palace where I was working at Houdini's mm-hmm. to Hera's to meet up with Lisa Close because she was working for Matt King. Okay. I, so I was in tears and I said, I just, I just want to know what I did wrong. And I found out what I had done wrong. I, I ripped off a Matt King line. And a lot of the material wasn't really worked. And especially the guy who has books called Workers is going to review. <laughs> uh, he obviously could see, he could see through it. Now, instead of really taking it so crazy to heart, which I should have learned later in life, um, I, uh, I actually looked through the review and I learned from it. And I went, and years later, all those products came back out, and you booked me around the world doing it, uh, and Danny Archer and everybody uh, booked me around the world doing it, um, where I fixed all the ideas, or like Sugar High, he had said, there's not a lot of outs for this. I have a million outs for Sugar High, and like that's when we re-released it with Murphy's and with Bizarro pr- producing it and all mm-hmm. that. Um, we re-released everything, like I'd say 10 years later. Um, just fixed everything instead of, and then some tricks that he didn't like, I had to look over it and go, he's right. This trick sucks. And I just deleted it from my act because I didn't really do it in walk around environments. I didn't really do it. It was just a clever idea to put out for magicians. Well, a lot of times we don't have that perspective that we can actually stand back and look at it. Number one, uh, subjectively, because we're thinking, hey, I'm pretty good. Uh, number two, it's a thing that we've been doing over and over, and you're getting good audience reaction from that. That still doesn't mean that it's original, but it's true that we're, a lot of us, some an amalgam of all of these ideas and things we're kind of trying to force into this skin bag of ours, I guess, basically, to have a, uh, a show to try to make it cohesive and still try to find ourselves while using a little bit of others. And I, I can't say that that's overall bad because that is how art is created by starting with the larger picture and then finding yourself i mean those people who for an example when surrealism was big were following salvador dali you know but then rene magritte found his own way you know but so many different people would start off i mean chappelle's chappelle's based off eddie murphy eddie murphy's based off richard pryor richard pryor and george carlin are both based off lenny bruce there you go. See, I mean, it's we all were influenced by somebody and we're arrogant to believe that we're not. And yeah. that's where I fell a few times was once you, I did start being on lecture tour and all these big magic inventions, covers of magazines, all this. You, your ego starts to do get out of control and say, this is mine. And you're like, oh, really? You're ripping off Lance and Chris Hart and Jeff McBride and these guys. Uh-huh. You're like, you're a different version of them. Don't get so ahead of yourself, you know, to think you came up with this. None of us came up with this. And the beautiful thing about magic is the mentorship. It's not ra- It's a rare thing that we have in magic where we see Chris Kenner uh, mentoring Nick DeFott. I've had many mentors, and one of mine I still, my, my main teacher I still talk to every day, which is Vito Lupo, who is in Italy, and he li- that's where Vito lives. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Like, Vito's the first magician I, I saw at a magic convention, and he's my teacher now. So the beautiful thing, we have this mentorship. A lot of other art forms and industries don't really have this. And I think that's what some of the things we're lucky to. So what, what I, I would the, – the, the one thing I would say about it to kind of end close out this topic, as long as you credit it and respect it and know where it came from, you know, if I have an idea, I know, all right, this really bases from Lance or from Billy, uh, Billy McComb or this guy. As long as you're not going out there saying it's yours, I think that's where the problem comes in. Well, we all stand on the shoulders of giants, certainly. But then again, as yep. far as the audience goes, that and particularly like the type of show you're doing on stage is a silent act. So it's not like afterwards that uh, in movies where there are credits thanking so and so for this and that. And even if you were going to be doing that kind of a thing uh, in a talking act and saying, hey, you know, thanks, Billy, as you say a line or whatever uh, that you do, that uh, that doesn't really mean anything to the audience. I mean, magicians and artists in general are, are big on credit, uh, as we well should be. But, um, you know, that is a difficult thing, as you say, of how to uh, recognize that's who they came from. I mean, how do you how do you go about 
uh, thanking people or letting them know when. In that well, I, well, I just wouldn't. I wouldn't put the product out as your own. Okay, so you mean like on a lecture or a DVD or something like that? You're saying. Now, in a lecture situation or at a magic convention, okay. you do have the opportunity to say, "Good point." Hey, this isn't mine. I've made it very clear that my ring routine is based off an idea Mark Kalen gave me. Mm-hmm. You've seen me lecture. Yes. Uh, mixed with Jonathan Neil Brown, Chris mm-hmm. Hart. Like it's a mix of me watching as a kid these guys at Caesar's Magical Empire and going, "Ooh, if I did this, I would do this." Are and you- that's kind of how I. Yeah, I, I remember a lecture many years ago that uh, David Hira had uh, put out and was touring around with, uh, and at that time it was uh, entitled "Cool Things I Have Learned." Uh, and he, in each trick, was like, "This is so and so's trick," and that uh, here's how this is done, and that uh, uh, basically kind of doing a little bit of uh, of, of these things. And then he would show his little twist on that. Uh, now, and I've said that kind of in hindsight, I don't know uh, still if that would be right in which that you're actually exposing things that are not yours, even though if you're crediting someone. And I say that because that there was a mentalism book that came out some years ago by a guy in Canada. The name escapes me. I've got a copy of that in my library behind me. But it is a um, fella uh, who had essentially taken all of great ideas from great magicians, you know, from Bob Cassidy and uh, Banachek and everybody else, basically, and each chapter was like someone else's trick. It was a combination of uh, different kinds of things. And uh, after he was called on it, then came back in and properly credited people. Still, it was <laughs> not right where he was, you know, teaching somebody, even though he said, okay, this would have been Chris, Chris Randall's idea. You know, so... Um, hmm. They, they never say that on the Penguin Lectures. They, <laughs> they teach Inception every other lecture. I don't get it, but anyway. It never well, if you. If, you, if, you, if you think about, like, the – see, this is what I respect, and I am a huge, not only Michael Lamar fan, friend, I'm a supporter, like, Michael Lamar for president. I know back in the day Michael got a lot of, like, heat for ideas and this and that, whatever. But if you look at the L&L series that taught most of us card magic, and especially my generation yeah. uh, learned magic off those uh, easy-to-master card miracles, mm-hmm. Michael did make sure that it was credited to everybody. And if it wasn't, it did not appear on those videos. I spent uh, a month in China with Michael. On, we did a dual lecture tour, and he explained the whole story and how he was. That man would never steal anything from anybody. No. There's been a few misunderstandings in the past. I've even talked to those people like uh, James Swain. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the end of the conversation, James Swain was all heated up. At the end of it, he was like, all right, you're right, Chris. Let's go to Mel's. You know, <laughs> when I was living by the castle, you know, a few years sure, ago. Sure, sure, sure. Well, you know, uh, so I, Greg Wilson or Gregory Wilson has been accused of that. And we had a big controversy on that on the podcast some years ago, too. Yeah, with Lovick and all them. But I'll tell you this. The man is a fantastic sleight of hand artist. I've loved his lectures throughout the year. He hosted my Murphys at the table and mm-hmm. did a fantastic job. And actually, at the end of it, was like, I'm working on all your material. Then came down to see me at Fremont like a week later and did that uh, exact change thing out of his pocket. It looked fantastic. Uh, that point, uh, it's the better version of recap. What's that called with the, uh, the pen cap? Um, pointless or pointless, something pointless. like that. That's it. Pointless. That thing fooled the hell out of me. Oh my god. Yeah. So the guy's a fantastic sleight of hand artist, and he was also my MC uh, three times when I was in the uh, uh, Palace of Mystery at the Castle. I was closing act doing my manipulation act. Huh. He was the host, and I would be backstage. And yeah, I have a very strong manipulation act and closing, especially. I would get so mad the way he was just connecting and destroying comedy wise with the audience. I was like, dang, I have to do like an eight minute silent act. <laughs> he gets to talk for like 30 minutes. Yeah. And like, I just want to talk. I want to talk. I want to do some of my Fremont stuff. Like, damn it. And like, <laughs> I had a girlfriend at that time. So like, I wasn't so mad that like every girl was going up to him at the bar and like talking to him. But I was like, Damn, every girl's going up to him and talking to him. Like, and they were like, you're so funny. You're so funny. I was like, Arr. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit jealous, it sounds like, I hear. <laughs> yeah. But, oh, you're the Michael Blue Blay guy. Yeah. yeah. I'm Michael Blue Blay guy. 
<laughs> well, that was why I said I want to kind of go back uh, just a little bit then to something I touched on then uh, a while ago, which kind of made you that Michael Bublé guy by using that music is, uh, of course, mm. your association with uh, Joni Spina because that, that she was extremely influential in a real crossroads in your life that took you from one place to another level. Can you talk a little bit about that? So in I Magic Live had... Um, Joni Spina, the choreographer uh, of David Copperfield, uh, she had her own show. She had worked with Jason Byrne, Mark Kornhauser, you name it, Mark Halen and Ginger especially. Um, so she was directing people once a year for her directions in Magic Magazine. And the first year she directed uh, Jason Andrews. Right. And then the second year, uh, it was supposed to be either Christopher Hart or Sophie Evans. And somehow I'd heard about it through maybe Kevin James and Stan Allen. Um, <clears throat> and so I sent in my video. I had just uh, got finished working with Jeff McBride and switched over my act from more of like a hard rock act to the, the Michael Bull Black, Michael Bull Play act that everybody knows me as. Um, and the martini glass, which unfortunately people knew me as. <laughs> um, so um, we, that act uh, I submitted, and um, I didn't really know what was going on. Like honestly, like I was doing Fremont, like uh, street performing. I was still doing restaurants, but then I still had this manipulation contest act. So I had like too many irons in the fire. To but be was honest. the only place you were performing that manipulation act was at conventions? Uh, I mean, you weren't performing on uh, corporate shows, I guess, or were you? Yeah, any place I could. It was a of pretty course. practical act. It, it is. Um, but I, I, was, I was also doing a lot of like open mics and opening act uh, stuff. Okay. Like I opened for the Amazing Jonathan. There was a theater next door. We did a thing called After the Show. Uh, it was based on a New York idea. So I did that a lot. Me and Luke Germay and Ben Seidman, we all did that show a lot. Uh, this is like 2000. Seven, I'd say. Okay. <clears throat> I was also opening for Nathan Burton. Um, I was doing that. I remember I was opening for Murray Sawchuk for a little while. So I, I did shop. I did. Uh, there wasn't really an act spot around town other than me and Jason Byrne for a little while. Mm hmm. Because there aren't act spots in Vegas anymore. There's not variety shows. They really don't have variety. You really put it very much. It is just a, a single person type of a, a show or one man show thing. Well, Jason has always had a job with David Sachs Corporation, with the V Theater and all that. <clears throat> I had to really jump around town and convince people to get me a spot. Like I would do it for really cheap money. A lot of it was to get ready for IBM's uh, for the contest. Mm hmm. So especially like 2013, I was every theater I was in Vegas, the Flamingo, Paris, you name it. I was opening for everybody. I was just trying to get that IBM win. I got second that year. It was the first year I made the finals. I remember. Then I then I took a year off. Uh, then I came back in 2015, and Shim Lin won Close Up Magic that year, and I won Stage Magic. Mm -hmm. That was a good year in Jacksonville, and then I took a year off again. And then in 2017 in Louisville, you and me uh, met there, and uh, I got my FISM invite. We talked, and we did a podcast there. Right. Um, you have a good photo of me with my little uh, uh, FISM invite thing. Yeah. Uh, I got second again. I technically won first. So on points, I'm not trying to take away somebody's win because he kicked my ass at the SAM and at FISM at Stuart McDonald. But mm -hmm. IBM, I actually did win again, uh, 2017. So 2015 and 2017, I was stage magician of the year, first place. Um, Oscar Munoz was so nice because you can't win with the same act twice at the IBM. Um, I won, I had the highest points, and so they gave me second place. But Oscar Munoz being so nice and feeling bad that... And he was I a was contest actually, chairman, uh, by the way. Not for that year. Oh, that okay. was the dual IBM SM. Oh, oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that was uh, Vinnie Grasso, Vinny. Joan Caesar, mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of people. <laughs> it was a whole group of people. Uh, Oscar uh, was not part of that year, but 2015, Oscar's wife 
did hand me my trophy. Uh, that's how I knew I won, actually, in, in Jacksonville. Because Oscar gave out every award. And then uh, for first place stage, he goes, this one's so good. I'm going to let my wife introduce it. And I looked at Trent James, who just won second place. And I went, I won. He goes, how do you know? I went, because he gave it to Melanie. And then yeah. Melanie introduced my name. And I dropped to my knees and cried. And, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. and then actually I ran, I don't know if you remember, the first thing I did was I ran to the front of the stage and yelled, I could pay everybody back. Because <laughs> <laughs> I had borrowed every dime to get there. If I didn't win, I was totally screwed. Yeah. So like Lee Asher's dad hooked me up with his best friend. To like He was my roommate, so I had to pay him the room. Dave Cox paid for my registration. Jason Byrne paid for my flight out. And when I won first place, and Jason Byrne, he got second place when he competed at IBM. He was like, he upgraded me to first class on the way back. Wow. That's that's cool. <laughs> that's a he's a guy. really cool, he's a really yeah. cool guy. Yeah. Um, well, again, that when you were saying that you had submitted your tape then and your, your act to uh, Joni and she had... I remember that at the time that she had a running column in Magic Magazine, and she was also soliciting people to send in their acts so that way that she could work with them to see if there was something that she could do to help them. And I know like one of them was Sir Patrick. I think it was out of uh, Cincinnati, Sir Patrick Ohio. was after me. After yeah. you. Yes, he was. Yeah. But I'm just saying that there were several people who were part of all of that, I guess. Um, he didn't submit my year. Like I, I, It was like 500 people had holy submitted. Holy cow. I did not know and that. And it was, it was like Chris Hart and Sophie Evans were the top two and both of them when they had heard I think it was like I don't know who had told me to submit I think it was McBride I think I owe this one again to McBride um, I think it was Jeff that told me to submit and you know my dad had this giant crush on Joni Spino my dad had already passed at that point but I always was like had this weird thing with Joni Spina like oh my dad would just love if I worked with you kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think between Jason Byrne, Mark Kornhauser, and then Chris Hart and Sophie Evans backed out. Huh. When they heard when they heard I was going to submit, they said, no, it should go to Chris. And they said, you know, what are you going to do for Chris Hart? He's 50-something years old, and he's Chris Hart. Come on. Yeah. You know, how much are you going to fix? That's a perfect act already. And then Sophie is a great act already. Like, So they both very nice and graciously bowed out for me. Uh, and then I got a month, uh, which would have been, you know, Joni Spina for day and day and day and day and out like that would have been about $4,000 a day for a month. Mm -hmm. What I got out of her. And were you, did, she was living in Reno at the time, I guess, right? No, she was here. Oh, she was in Vegas at the time. Okay. So you just kind of went over to her place and talked. Oh, no, she picked, uh, as, <laughs> Because I'm the degenerate that I am, I didn't have a car, and I was working on Fremont, and so she would pick me up from Fremont and then drop me off at home. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, her mom even had said that Joni wanted to leave me her car in her will, so I, I didn't care that I didn't get it. I was just like, her mom died at the same time. Her mom was supposed to put it all together. Then her wow. mom died like uh, three weeks later. I did not know that. Was that unexpected, or had she been her mom? Her mom was ill, and she lived next door, and Joni had, like, 70 cats in the backyard. Yeah. Joni had turned into a cat lady. Um, I know that she was really big with the animal shelter uh, thing. Y yeah, and that's why she was like, I'm so sick of pig. I mean, it was like a little, like, uh, little red car that she was going to give me. I was like, okay, I don't care. Um, there was, so it was like 30 days I had with her. One day I did, in Chris Randall fashion, I worked Fremont, you know, I met a girl, we went out drinking all night, and I slept in. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I didn't go to my Joni Spina session. And I was awoken by my phone blowing up from Stan Allen. And he said, you know how many people go? And he, I, I, Stan is the sweetest man alive, he's a very, very Christian man, and uh, I, my mom goes to the same church with him, um, and... Stan was very mad at me, <laughs> and I was very scared of Stan that day, um, and I made sure I was, like, very early and theater-focused, like, I did not uh, take the opportunity, uh, like, so, 
okay, I'll be there tomorrow, whatever. You know, like, I'm not getting paid for this. I got to be down here on Fremont and get some money, you know, like, or, you know, like an idiot. I was hung over with some girl. Yeah. Uh, that was dumb. And so I came in the next day and, oh, Joni was very mad. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I, I, I would have guessed she was more forgiving, but she was upset with you. No, that was the hardest session. She worked me so hard. And in a way, I kind of look back and go, that was the best session we had, actually. And she was like, that was a good one. Come in tomorrow like that. And Bizarro used to always say, the best I ever performed when I was a little pissed off or when I had something to prove. Hmm. He was like, that's when you're always your best. And hmm. I think that's something that uh, I don't think missed at FISM, but I think I was a little relaxed at FISM. So, yeah. so you did compete in FISM, and now you, is that right? And that, as I recall, back in, uh, what was that, 18? So, so in 2018, 18. I uh, traveled to South Korea, uh, Busan. What was that like, by the way, just uh, briefly? Is that kind of scary so, a little bit? Well, I had a really – so thank you, Scott, for this opportunity. For finally, Mark D'Souza was going to write this up. Uh, it's the fi- uh, first time I get to actually tell my side of the story okay. of what happened at FISM. <laughs> you didn't get thrown in there's, <laughs> there's a lot of stories that go around right now. And okay. uh, What's the truth? I've here heard, we go, right here. <laughs> I, I've, I've heard a lot of crazy ones. Um, so here we go. Um, so as you know, I was working at Masters of Illusion at Bally's Hotel at the Jubilee Theater. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were the first show since the Jubilee show. I had a fantastic run. I did a lot better, I think, than the producers expected. My producers were Gay Blackstone, uh, David Martin, and David McKenzie, the producers of Masters of Illusion, where I did five seasons on that television show. I did a lot of tours around the world for them. Uh, promoting the show and TV shows and uh, news daily shows, all this stuff. So then I got the call. I was uh, headed to Paris to do Le Cabaret Pleu du Monde uh, with Patrick Sebastian, the famous TV show in Paris. I got the gig from my buddy Hans Klock. I was flying out to Paris, and David Martin and Gay Blackstone called me. I think a little part thanks to you, it was the uh, San Antonio uh, IBM. IBM convention, right. Mm-hmm. I Because I'd won Jacksonville, and I came back as the winner, and we did that Johnny Thompson show. That's right. Me, Joseph Gabriel, uh, Tommy, and Emily. Great show. Great that a, show. That was a very good evening, yeah. And I had a pretty decent night, actually. And if you remember, I introduced Gay in the middle of the audience and all I this. do remember. You had her stand up, yeah. In fact, I think she was sitting right in front of me. Uh, she's my magic mama. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when she was produ- pitching stuff, uh, the spot I was up for it was either me, Julian and Chen, or Jeff McBride. Jeff McBride very sweetly gave up the spot to me. Uh, he was going to do it, but then he, he has so many irons in the fire, <laughs> he couldn't commit to one thing. Mm-hmm. So I got the spot, and so I did 10 months in the Jubilee Theater in Bally's Hotel, uh, TV, uh, press, Covers of magazines like the MUM, uh, the cover of uh, Las Vegas Sun, uh, City Weekly. It was amazing. It was everything I've ever dreamed of as a child. I had the woman of my dreams. Uh, I lived in L.A. across from the castle. I had the apartment of my dreams. You name it. Um, and so it was great. Uh, being on stage every day at Jubilee Theater, I got to do 17 different routines other than my FISM act. And I got to do my FISM act uh, every night uh, leading up to going to Korea. So I, um, June 1st, I leave Las Vegas, my last show at Masters of Illusion. I went to do two shows at the Comedy and Magic Club, one at Monday Magic in Santa Monica, and fly out of L.A. to Korea. Uh, I did my two nights of Comedy Magic Club. Uh, during their uh, 40th anniversary. And then when I was doing Monday Magic, I found out my next-door neighbor and the person I take care of every single day uh, passed away. Oh, boy. Uh, Brian Gills. Yeah, man. And so He'd been Bill ill Ward for what, about in. nine months or so with uh, pancreatic no, cancer, wasn't he? No. It was fairly quick. Uh, uh, it was, so Brian had some heart stuff going on. 
Hmm. I didn't know about that. It wasn't cancer. It was uh, heart stuff. He died oh. of a heart attack. Um, Brian, uh, so when I got the cover of MUM, I came back home to win the um, Strolling Olympics at Magic Castle. Mm-hmm. So I came home on my days off. I was like, I want to win Strolling Olympics. And that, so I got second the year before, and I was like, I want to win it. So I came back to win it, see Brian, see my girlfriend, and give Brian the cover of MUM. So I went into his apartment where I used to live, and my girlfriend would kick me out all the time. <laughs> and so like, <laughs> Brian was my best friend in L.A. He was my best friend. He said, you know, just he gave me – he we talked about if one day he had passed away – things to do so i did have instructions to go into the apartment and make sure things were fine for the family um so i uh i go into monday magic and i have two days till fism and joe ward walks in and says brian gillis died wow Wow. so i went on i did my act um And then my girlfriend, who had also taken care of Brian Gillis and the dogs, and Brian had just, we found out pretty quickly, Brian left the dogs to us. Mm -hmm. Brian left everything to me and my girlfriend. Hmm. Uh, His brother called me from Buffalo or from Niagara Falls, so Brian left you everything. Like, it was was very weird. I, I said, I don't, I have to go to Korea and, like, 48 hours. You did know? he leave you with some secrets also? I'm curious, uh, you know, or did that secret die with him as far as, like, the uh, uh, dog collar with the uh, name on it? Well, I used to do it for him. Oh, you did? Yeah, me and Sue Penn. Okay. And Annie. And Annie, the, gotcha. the last wife thing. You, okay. You were the person under the table or behind the Yeah, whatever. Okay. Oh, I was behind in the close-up room. Yeah. Um, uh, Brian used to want to give me the Bill and Sugar packet all the time. Mm-hmm. And I said, I have Bill and Lemon. I have my own thing, Brian. Right, right. Like, and he used to come see me in the parlor, and he loved it. And it was like, uh, I just love your pacing. I'm like, you know what my pacing is? You on the 1991 Magicians at the Magic Castle special and the Johnny Carson show. Like, I'm your pacing. I'm either <laughs> Lance. Sean Farquhar and me agreed on this. We're, you're, if you're a stage guy, you're Lance. If you're a close guy around our time period, you're Brian Gillis. Like, Brian Gillis was that cool guy. Like, yeah. he wasn't Goshman who was fat and looking all sloppy. He was Mr. Cool and get any guy, any pretty girl sweet. in the room. Pretty, yeah, mm-hmm. Brian Gillis was pretty awesome. Um, and Greg Wilson, uh, he actually worked really closely with Brian towards the end on his, uh, his version of a tossed out deck, peak deck thing. It's not tossed That's right, out the peak deck. Pack. That's right, peak pack. The peak pack. Uh, Greg awesome. Wilson is the one who actually really made him put that out. You know, uh, funny, just an aside on that story, is that I put together a lecture tour for both Brian and for Greg. And uh, Greg said, before you have me go out, have Brian go first, and I'll follow him back cleanup. Because uh, what he doesn't sell, I will. Because that peak pack is going to make him a lot of money. And if it doesn't, I will make him more money because I'll be selling it in my lecture as well because it's that good. And I uh, worked, uh, as it turned out, with uh, Brian. He really, at that time, wasn't interested in traveling more than just a few hundred miles outside of his home there in L.A. It's like, hey, you know, you've been on this, Chris. It's across the country. There are thousands of miles. And, eh, you know, after I put this thing together. I was the one who made him do the Penguin Lecture. (laughs) Well, I'm glad you twisted his arm on that, at least so he got that out there. Because I said, for exactly what we have right now, we don't have Brian, but at least we have that footage. Yeah. Yeah. I made Eric Evans do it, too. Oh, that's good, too. Yeah, I like Eric. Yeah. Well, oh, he, Eric Evans he, is the greatest freak magician alive. Yeah, but he went out on a lecture many years ago, and I want to say like in With the Asher. 90s or something. Uh, he yeah. went on the Asher tour. Yes, I think that was it. I think that uh, uh, Lee had put him out uh, way back when. But Because um, Eric uh, lived here in Texas for a long time, and I knew him quite well. I believe he lives up in he Austin. He still lives in San Antonio. Oh, he's in San Antonio? Okay. San Antonio. Um, that may have been the last time I saw him, perhaps, was uh, when we had the two. So, Eric, if there. you're listening, I want my Slidini silks. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was writing for Vanish Magazine recently on street performing. Yeah. Paul was nice enough to let me write one article, and I said, you know what? All I'm going to do is re-recite everything Eric told me. Mm-hmm. So, now Eric is now writing the article. So, I gave the article to Eric, and I said, you know what? He you're has a great... 
Uh, well, he has a Patreon, uh, you know, the, yeah, the yeah. website Patreon. As we, Eric we, has which, a, by the way, I want to, while well, you're mentioning that, that uh, for those who are listening, uh, if you'd like to help the Magic Word podcast, that we are on Patreon.com. So go and check us out there at uh, the Magic Word. And uh, if you can slip us a buck or two a month, that's perfect. You know that I need. Uh, I will. <laughs> some I will join. I <laughs> will you. join because there's you have like different levels, right? I do completely. Yeah, there's some cool things you can get some pretty good perks. I bought the premium level with Eric Evans mm-hmm. because Eric is just so cool. Uh, his magic is it's beautiful. Uh, his work on the flip stick and Cellini's work is just wonderful. But yeah, yeah. Well, I bought his monkey fists, those little uh, balls for the chop cups. I mean, the, the cups and balls that he was selling. You know what I'm talking about? The monkey. I fists. would get I would get his Slidini silks. I've got some good Slidini silks that I got from uh, Sean Farquhar when he picked up Palmer Magic years ago. And then uh, also... This is all the, the Cellini work, though. The Bill Wish is going to... Well, Bill Wish has got uh, uh, Slidini's work, and he's going to be putting out a DVD sometime soon. When he last came through on a tour that I had him on this in 2019, that uh, he was saying that uh, this is his next project, is to put together this DVD with stuff that Slidini had taught him about the silks and all the subtleties and everything, and then it will come with some uh, of those uh, parachute material silks. So um, anyhow, that's something I think it's for people to look forward to. Well, check out this Penguin Live lecture. It's okay. fantastic. So fantastic. I'm kind of getting aside. Also, so anyhow, back to, uh, to FISM. So you were uh, uh, in... So, I, so I, I, um, I, uh, not, right before I left, actually, I um, went on TV... I did a lot of TV news shows every day for Masters Illusion and Valleys. And I did this one right before I left. It was very sweet. The newscasters in Las Vegas had this really wonderful send-off to me. And then the next day, my childhood hero, Lance Burton, went on TV and did this whole... He went on the news show the next day and was the guest host and did a lot of the special uh, dedicated to me. Do you? Wow. So, uh, it was. I did not know this. Because okay, he'd already so, won FISM, so now he's kind of passing the torch on to you and said, here's the next guy. It's going to be Well, we were great. also having lunch every Tuesday. Me and Lance had become friends, and we've had a long relationship. And so, like, I love Lance. Like, he's the reason I'm a sage magician. Uh, so, I don't know this. I go to L.A., I've got Brian dies. I sleep on the couch for a day. I get myself back up. I... I actually used one of a fellow competitor's music to get myself up on Han Lim from South Korea. Uh, a good buddy of mine, a good buddy of South, uh, Kevin James. He's a, he won first place in manipulation. If you don't know on Han Lim, he's fantastic. I think the best card manipulator alive. So I, I listen to his music. I get myself out of bed. Um, and I get out there to Korea and I call Vito Lupo and Vito and, uh, Masters of Illusion sends me off very nicely. Everybody's like, you got this, you know? I worked uh, every day. I re-changed the act every day. Like, I had 120 shows at Masters of Illusion to videotape and change with Vito every day. I was paying Vito tons of money. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So I go over there, and I call Vito, and I'm like, hey, I want to cry because of Brian. He goes, nope. You get to cry after the contest, you know. Uh, it's your time to win and enjoy your time. Have fun. And so I have a different suit for every day. I see Max Maven, Gabe Tom Bloom. Everything, uh, ev- FISM comes up to me and says, you might be the most perfect competitor we've ever seen. Wow, what a comment. Uh, because I was wearing a suit and I was treating it like a press appearance because I was kind of famous at that point. So, like, yeah, especially I've toured around Asia doing lecture tours, so I was getting a lot of guys from China. When I walked off the plane, all of a sudden my girlfriend was like, what the hell's going on? I'm like, oh, those are my buddies. All these guys from China just grabbed our bags and got us to the hotel. We didn't ask them to. It just happened. It was really sweet. And it happened on the way home, too. And she was like, your minions are here. I'm like, <laughs> they're wide lectured around the world. Like, and so I spent time with these people. So yeah, they're, and you know, I'd always give, I never sold half of my products. I gave most of them away. Uh, and so whatever contest goes on, like everything is perfect. 
I go on and I did the best show of my life. Can't ask for more I got than a, that. I got a perfect, I got a standing ovation. I had people cheering, bravo, Chris, bravo, Chris. Okay. And uh, I said to my girlfriend, like, it's a lot of anxiety. Like, like a lot of Feds and competitors have the same saying that we all say when we walk off stage. And it's, I get my life back. Hmm. So, like, uh, Han So Wee from Korea, the CD guy. Yeah. Uh, Steve Owens, my buddy, the day before, sure. he, uh, he came off stage crying and said, I get my life back. Because all you think about is this moment, Stuart McDonald, Eric Buss, all my buddies. And even, like, I had a Russian guy, and Norbert Faree, and all these people came up and shared the same experience. It was a beautiful kind of, like, coming together. I really hadn't thought about that, about uh, getting your life back, because all of your focus for so many years... Three is years. For three years, three for years. those few moments on stage. And when it's over, that is a big sigh of relief. And it's like, I've done the best I can, and there you go. I can get back to doing whatever I do- was doing before. Life. I remember I remember the funniest story I think I ever heard about it was actually Lori Farquhar. She had told Sean the last time when he went to China, we're not doing this again. When? Because <laughs> think about it. Three people going to FISM three times in a row. That's a lot of money. Yeah. That's $30,000 every three years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, so, there was a fellow here in Houston uh, who had won for North American uh, FISM with his Illusion Act, but he said, I can't afford to pack all these illusions and my assistants and everything to uh, to do that. So it's not just the rehearsal and everything else, but it is just financially uh, not reasonable, you know, they could do that. So there are probably well, a lot of really good acts well, around the world that can't do that. Quebec would be a good year for him. <laughs> could, could very well be because of that. That's well, not. they are extending, by the way. Oh, yeah. Is that right? Because the North yeah. Americans have been uh, canceling. Because the I had to back out, actually, at the last minute. Mm-hmm. And then I talked to Joan Caesar and Renee, and they said, well, we are extending a few things because I couldn't make this. I actually semi-retired from Magic. Um, so I went and got a waiter job. Like, I had to, like, talk to my boss, and they said, we can't let you off May 1st. Mm-hmm. So now that it's delayed... I actually got a pass to go, yeah, mm-hmm. we can make it happen. Well, that's good news. So so after the show was over, so uh, you, and you felt good about yourself, and you'd done the, uh, the best you could, so what So, uh, all right, so now the hard part, Scott. <laughs> Here you go, viewers. This is it. Listeners. Uh, so um, I, uh, I go back to my hotel room. My girlfriend even says, I think you should go back to the hotel room. Don't watch the gala show tonight. We were supposed to see the gala show because my, like, previous whatever best friend, uh, Mike Douglas Mondre, sure. was in the show. Mm-hmm. And I had, uh, they had messed up a lot with our hotel rooms and seats. Like, they did it. It was weird that it only happened with the Americans. Hmm. It was a little. Coincidental. I, I don't want to say racism, but uh, yeah, FISM Korea was a little racist against the Americans. Okay. And every American can tell you this. Because people who are Korean would walk into the hotel across from FISM and get a room that day. I had my room nine months earlier, and they switched us five miles down the street. Oh, boy. Wow. And every American, uh, and the only and the only Canadian, Nicholas Dutel. So anyway, I do my act. I go and I was like, and I don't smoke cigarettes, so I go out and there's a lot of Asian, uh, Korean people. I'm just like, uh, so Asians smoke a lot, so I knew <laughs> I was gonna get a cigarette. So I got this like little Virginia Slim tiny cigarette. And I smoke like two puffs of it and I like start coughing. I'm like, ah, okay, I did something. <laughs> okay, I haven't done something in like a year. I haven't drank or eaten, eaten sugar. I've done something. I did something. Okay, God. Can't get weed over here. All right. Uh, so anyway, I uh, I go, I see my girlfriend. We have this really great crying hug and all this. Mm-hmm. She goes, let's go back to the room. And we had heard that if you're going to be in the Grand Prix Finals, that means you're a first place winner. You'll get an email by the end of the night. Eric Buss made a joke. 
none of us are sleeping till 1 a.m. You know, <laughs> like, so yeah. I go immediately back to the room and my girlfriend gives me a Xanax. I never had a Xanax in my life. I'm not a you pill. Out. I'm not a pill person. Yeah. I've I was always a drinker or I smoked pot. That was it. And I wasn't drinking or smoking pot, especially in Asia. So I took it and my tolerance, I guess, was crazy down. And I knocked out. I knocked out really hard. I woke up around two in the morning and I grabbed a book that a friend of mine gave me. It was about like Buddhist kind of stuff. So I was reading it and then my phone started going off. I was supposed to headline a convention in like Colorado Springs or something Springs. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maxwell Blade, I think it is the name. Okay. That convention. So I was supposed to be the, the headliner. I was supposed to get like four thousand dollars. So I, I got my rent for LA for a minute. I'm coming back to Masters no matter what. They've already told me that. And so I wake up and I don't get that you're in the finals. So I'm like, oh, this isn't good already. Then I get an email that says, also you're not coming back to Masters of Illusion in Vegas. We're replacing you with Jonathan Pendragon. Um, so they just kind of like told me what they wanted to, to get me on the plane. And then I get another email that says, so this was what the the phone, you said the phone was lighting up and that was what the, the phone was just to say, Hey, you were supposed to be here. No, I got messages. Oh, there were messages. Gotcha. That's what they were saying. But you were supposed to have been at a convention actually, but you were at FISM instead. No, no, no. I was because of my FISM run and the master's run. A convention came to see me at Masters and yes. said, "We want you as our headliner." Oh, I see. I see. I misunderstood. Like Imagine. they had Ma- they had McBride the year before. Yeah, so it's a good thing. I know what you're talking about. So that would have been yeah, yeah, the uh, Rocky Mountain uh, Magic. Yeah, convention. that thing. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Lou Weimisner and those guys. Mm-hmm. I was I was the headliner, and yeah. so like all this money was coming through, and like so it was kind of fine. Yeah. And all of a sudden, overnight, you lost your job in Vegas. You lost that convention. I'm looking over at my girlfriend, and I'm like, as soon as she wakes up, we're going to start fighting over money, because that's what couples do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, L.A.'s, other than the castle, hasn't been that prosperous, because I don't have, like, street performing. I don't have – I haven't figured out L.A. yet, you know? Mm-hmm. And so um, something snaps in me, and I had a nervous breakdown, Scott. Wow. I, um, I They're went in the hotel the room. Mm-hmm. No, I, uh, I quietly left the room. Uh, the, the second uh, hotel that FISM gave like down five miles from the street. And I went to the beach and, uh, I'm not a strong swimmer and I tried to throw myself into the ocean. Holy moly. Uh, thankfully I hadn't drank for a year. Um, some very drunk Korean kids <laughs> uh, grabbed me out. out of the ocean mm-hmm. and was like, you just need a drink. And I was like, okay, uh, whatever. I was ready to die. So, all right. So I had a few vodka sodas. And uh, from then till about, I'd say New Year's Eve, I don't really remember. I pretty much blacked out and had a mental breakdown. I did not, like, I had everything I'd ever wanted in my life and lost it in an email. And I just didn't know how to handle it. I prepared with Vito and Masters and... And so was uh, that, I, that was in South I, Korea that you had that breakdown? And so did you go in the hospital? Did you stay in the hotel? Or what happened at that point? I stayed on the beach... Um, and then I went back to the room for a little bit and I think then they did the Grand Prix finals and had all that. And I just couldn't sit in the room anymore. So I went back to the convention Mm -hmm. and cried to Danny Cole and a few people, Veronin and two, uh, French people, um, Nestor Hato 
who won second place in manipulation, which was a fantastic card act, and uh, Florian Savant, who won first place in manipulation and tied with Anhan Lim, who does like this Tron robot act. He's fantastic. Mm -hmm. They took me back to the same damn beach to celebrate, and I celebrated their win. I drank wine with them, and I watched them like hug and kiss this girl, and Mm -hmm. I said to them, you know, I have to go back to America, and so I turned away from the beach. I looked over the beach one more time and said, this is a beautiful moment I got to share in with these two guys and their win, you know? They are two Frenchmen who went to South Korea at FISM and topped the manipulation category in mm-hmm. South Korea. In their own country. That's impossible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's impossible. Like, they beat the Koreans in right. manipulation. So I said, this is a beautiful moment, and as soon as I turn away, it's going to be really awful for me. But this is what I have to do. And so for about six months, I went into uh, very crazy isolation and uh, a lot of therapy and medicine. And I have a fantastic therapist who has really gotten me through what all this means. I did lose my girlfriend. I did lose my job. I did lose everything. Conventions, I uh, heard I went crazy. I, the rumors are that I'm in a South Korean prison, um, that I was screaming Donald Trump uh, in the lobby. That's weird. Um, the only thing, and this is uh, friends of mine from England, because I had toured 24 cities in 30 days in England uh, in 2014. A few of my friends had introduced me my English friends were just having a bout, you know. They were like, he's just from America. He's not Donald Trump. And I think that got misinterpreted. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing was that I'd heard that, like, um, whatever, uh, was that I was flying an American flag. Everybody at FISM is flying the flags of their country. Japan, this mm-hmm. Japanese person walks up, they fly the Japanese flag. So I kind of know who said I flew an American flag. I was watching this Jason Derulo colors video from the World Cup. <clears throat> and so I saw he was like, like wearing his flag around him. So I jokingly, my mom works, she's, she's, my mom is a janitor. And she uh, works for the school district and all this. And so I had said to her, jokingly, but kind of like, you know, like, it would be nice to have an American flag if I won. Just to kind of like, yeah, right. isn't this the Olympics? Shouldn't I support my country? Exactly. Right, right. Like, I don't think that's, I'm a racist. No. You know, like, I don't know. They do that at the that Olympics. Matters. Exactly. Right, right. So I didn't get that. So backstage, my mom gave me a flag. And I was like, well, my mom gave me this. I brought it all this way. So all I did was behind my props backstage, I taped it up behind mm-hmm. my props. Well, one act from Spain who did place, by the way, um, kept actually checking out my props when I went to the bathroom. Yeah. So at one point, I did pull my flag and put it over my props. Like, dude, if I come out from the bathroom <laughs> again and see you looking at my props, I'm talking to the FISM people. The Grand Prix winner, actually, he actually, when I was setting my props, came out and set his props. I said, well, the FISM rules, you can't be on stage until uh, if you're on at FISM. If I'm on stage and Steve Owens is next, he's the only person allowed to be on the stage. Everybody else has to be in the back hallway. Mm -hmm. This guy was... Uh, 10 competitors back from me. And, and no business during, being there. And during I was he, the setting of uh, my act, he was setting his act. I said, what are you doing? Like, oh, it's okay. I'm a, from a Spain. And he is the Grand Prix winner. Uh, yeah. And and w- what I was told by FISM was, uh, we have to make him look good, which 
is kind of weird because when I, w- I arrived at the airport, it's the only thing I'm going to say ever about this. When I arrived at the airport in South Korea, I went up and I saw a person with a FISM sign. And I said, oh, I'm with FISM. And they said, oh, what's your name? Oh, you're a competitor. And they said, we're here to pick up the talent. Oh, the people who were the paid acts. And when I looked on the name on the thing they were picking up from the airport, mm-hmm. it was one of the competitors. Oh, so it wasn't who was, the paid act. Okay. Who was the stage Grand Prix winner. Gotcha. Interesting. So then I did I did come back from uh, uh, Korea. Uh, a lot of rumors. I was stuck in Korean prisons, all this stuff. <clears throat> I, uh, I lived in an apartment for about six months. A lot of depression. Figuring out what I was going to do next and what's my next steps. And it was friends like Scott Alexander uh, who sent me videos and taught me how to do like a 90-minute show and really do a show. Um and then I actually just went back open to my mom, and uh, I got a real job. So I'm a waiter at Applebee's now. Ah, okay. But now, so that's uh, bringing us up to date to where we are. But to kind of wrap things up, did, are, are you going to be competing again in 21, or are you pretty much uh, done with the competition? No, because I kind of figured out a lot of what FISM means. And like, I, I think your first FISM, if you win your first FISM, you're lucky. You're mm-hmm. lucky. Nobody wins their first FISM. Sean didn't. Nobody does. Parikh, uh, Johnny East Palmer, nobody does. Right. Maybe if you're the Lance, but who's Lance? Come on. <laughs> so uh, Joan Caesar and Renee did confirm that I will be in the parlor competition in close-up. So I'm basically doing a, a different version of the act I did in Korea. But my act is kind of small because of the ice cubes and stuff like that. Uh-huh. So, so it plays better for the parlor type of a Yeah, and I th- I think... Uh, so have you been confirmed then as a competitor for 21, or do you still have to compete? I mean, since the uh, North American FISM has been postponed? Uh, well, comp- well, here, I, I was in ready for uh, May, and then when I, I, because of my job, I found out, oh, I might not be able to make May. So I kind of dropped out. Of uh, so the that, uh, competition. The 2020. Right. Because my boss was like, you just started working here. Right, I understand. And I'm not a very good waiter. <laughs> okay. I do a lot of close-up. All right? <laughs> so now that they postponed that, that you're going to be uh, competing whenever they do that, and depending upon the outcome of that, will result in whether or not you'll be competing and come back in 21. Well, not only that, my boss at my job has been a little more uh, nice about, all right, we're going to let you do this. We'll we'll help you out. Good, good. Like, so uh, Joan Caesar and Renee have been really sweet. I got my confirmation from Joan Caesar the other day. Uh, I will be in the parlor uh, set of the comp- mm-hmm. competition. Uh, I've replaced the ring routine. That's out. Okay. So I, I put a balls to mouth routine and through line that, uh, especially my mentor and teacher is Vito Lupo. So that's mm-hmm. even going to be better. Uh, yeah. I feel a lot better. It's all going to fit on the plane. That's nice. So it sounds like by being able to put this on the plane and uh, packing flat and playing big, it's easy to have an act that's going to be able to travel with you easily. And I wish you luck uh, then in uh, the upcoming contest and hope to see you then in Quebec next year. And as we wrap up over here, I do want to ask you, I know that you have lived through quite a bit, obviously, from the exploits you've just uh, told us over the last hour here. So what is your philosophy of life? What is your magic word now? What do you live by? What's important to you? Hope. Um I was told I might be the first cancel culture magician, and I want hope to be that no, it's not over. You can, we have a great brotherhood that still supports you and loves you, and you should hope that things can get better. Like we have to at this moment in our lives. Right. I like that. Yep. Have hope. 
And um, we, we do have a great brotherhood in, uh, in this world. And the fact that you have traveled around and seen it in, in action about how people, as you'd mentioned, picking up at the airport and, and supporting you in so many different ways, uh, you know, through thick and thin and through ups and downs and, uh, you know, still fighting here. So uh, good luck and uh, let's keep that hope. Thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate you being a guest. Thank you. And I hope to be a, uh, another employee of you in the next few years. <laughs> All righty. I, I have a book I'm working on. Okay, well, I'm anxious to see that. So, Magic Word Podcast. That was Chris Randall. This is Scotty Young. Well, I want to thank Chris Randall for being my guest here this week. And uh, it's also interesting to compare and contrast uh, the past with what the current situation is. And I thank you very much, Chris, for really bearing your soul and uh, telling us your story here for the world to hear. And I know that it will provide some inspiration perhaps to some others. I know that uh, I'm looking forward to you're talking about having a book that you've got uh, coming out sometime sooner that you're working on at least now. I know that takes some time. And so perhaps that might be part of your five year plan then as well. So I uh, look forward to uh, that coming to fruition. And I uh, know also, as you had finally recognized there that you can't always win the first time out, but you just have to keep going back and trying. So it sounds like that you still have that as one of your goals. And that's one of the things that I always continue to preach about, and that is it's important to have goals. It's important to have a long-term plan. I tell people all the time you should have a one-year, three, five, ten a 20-year and a 30-year plan, so this way that you have an idea where you want to go. Now, of course, in your case, obviously, it didn't turn out in the past several years of where you plan to go, but it's important, I believe, to be able to change the rudder and reset your sails and go in the direction that is uh, going to be more realistic. Now, that's not to say that you shouldn't set unrealistic goals, but they should be attainable goals, something that with the help of others, perhaps, and your commitment, your dedication, that you can achieve those kinds of goals. And then once you get to those points in your life with one and three and five years, look back and see whether or not that you have attained those. Have you actually gone past those or not? And what needs to be changed in order to uh, attain that and get to the next level? Uh, or perhaps that you may have completely different aspirations, uh, if, you know, five years later than when you had originally set these, whenever that you were much younger. Now that you become a more mature person, perhaps that your ideals and your goals may have changed as to what's most important in your life and where you want to continue to go. But at that point, again, reset your rudder and set your sail. And that way that you can have smooth sailing and a successful future, which I wish for each and every one of you. So until next week, stay well, get booked, and remember to always have hope. This is Scotty out. <laughs>